All right, welcome everybody back. I'm glad to have everybody here again today. Um, I put this Bible study together called Law and Tradition. Many people don't realize uh, why Yeshua was killed. You have talked to people and they think that he came to do, he was rebuking the Pharisees because they were teaching obedience to the law. But as I'll show you here in the scripture, that's just not the case. Everyone knows he was killed, but why did they kill him? He was killed for being a heretic because he preached obedience to his father's commandments, which was the rabbinical law, the traditions of the elders. These were the traditions pushed and taught by the Pharisees, um, which were, you know, against his command, against the father's commandments. But uh, they were the added traditions of men. The Pharisees read the Torah in the synagogues each Sabbath. But they also added their own traditions to the doctrine and esteemed those traditions above the law of in the Torah of Yahweh. Let's see what the scripture has. And we got scripture here that is mentioned and them talking about their traditions. This is why they accused Yeshua. Matthew 15, 2 says, Why do these disciples, why do thy disciples transgress the traditions of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. Mark 7, 3 says, For the Pharisees and the Jews, except they wash their hands, often eat not, holding to the traditions of the elders. Mark 7, 5 says, Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the traditions of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? As you can see, the Pharisees were worried about their traditions more than the law of Yahweh. Now let's look at the scriptures where Yeshua rebuked them and warned about their traditions, but they would rather keep their traditions over the law of Yahweh. Matthew 15, 3 says, But he answered and said to them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your, trans or by your tradition? Matthew 15, 6 goes on to say, And honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Mark 7, 8 says, For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups and many other such things that ye do. Mark 7, 9 says, And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God that ye may keep your own tradition. Mark 7.13 says, Making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such things like ye do. So as you can see, the Messiah was constantly rebuking the Pharisees for holding their traditions above the law and the commandments of Yahweh. The apostles warned of this throughout the New Testament as well. This was a common theme throughout the New Testament. Colossians 2.8 says, Beware lest any man spoil you, through philosophy and vain deceit, after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of this world, and not after Christ. 1 Peter 1.18 says, For so much, for as much, as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by traditions from your fathers. So, as you can see, throughout the scripture, the Messiah was rebuking them, the, the Pharisees, for keeping the traditions that they were passed down through rabbinical Judaism. This was stuff that came from uh, ancient Babylon, pagan beliefs and cultures, just like what we're dealing with in the churches today. They were keeping those things, they esteemed those things up here, up high, yet the commandments of Yahweh were down here. They would always over supersede and they would do what they wanted to do rather than being obedient. So did Yeshua teach that we should keep his father's commandments and laws? Of course he did. Or he'd be a false prophet and we would have been a sin and would have been a sinner and could not be our savior. Uh, for Yeshua to be our savior, he had to be sinless without spot or wrinkle. He had to be perfect, the perfect sacrifice. And to do so, he had to obey his father's law perfectly. This is how he fulfilled the law. He never said, I came to destroy the law, but to fulfill it, meaning live it to the fullest and live it out perfectly so that he could be the perfect atonement for our sins. Therefore, all the instances where he was accused by the Pharisees, he was not breaking the biblical laws 
or the Sabbath. He was only breaking and throwing down the additional traditions added to the teachings by the Pharisees. This is what was referred to as back then the oral law, and now modern day is called the Talmud. Uh, this is what Judaism. So the Jews in, in, in Israel, they, they keep Judaism. This is um, what, a, what a Judaizer is, right? Th these are people that are keeping all this stuff above the commandments of Yahweh. They do not keep the law like the Bible says. They keep the traditions of men uh, and supersede that. They esteem that above the law of Yahweh. So Matthew 5.17 says, 5.17 through 20, the Messiah himself says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So I, I have had so many people tell me that Yeshua said, yes, yeah, see, see, fulfill means he did away with it. Then if, if that was the case, then he would say, think not that I have to destroy the law or the prophets. I have not come to destroy, but I've come to destroy. I mean, he, that would make no sense. If he came to do away with it, why would he say that he didn't come to do away with it? So as you can clearly see here, he didn't do away with it. He says, for verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or one tittle, and shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break the least of these commandments and shall teach men to do so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall teach and do them, the same, same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. So why did he say this? For one, key, sta key statements here in these passages are that the law would still stand until heaven and earth pass away. That clearly hasn't happened yet. He said, anyone who breaks the least of these and teaches men to do so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Notice that he says, unless our righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, we will not enter into the kingdom. Why is that? It's because the scribes and the Pharisees um, it's because they did not live by Yahweh's law, but rather their own traditions, which do nothing for them and had nothing to do with obedience to the Father. They intentionally broke Yahweh's law in lieu of their traditions. Notice he said that not one jot or tittle of the law passed away until heaven and earth passed away. I already talked about that, and that clearly hasn't happened yet. So if there were no law, there would be no way to know what sin is, because sin is transgression of the law. 1 John 3, 4 says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is transgression of the law. Let's look at what Paul said here about the law and sin in Romans 7, 7 and verse 7, 8. Um, and, in, and in this chapter, uh, Paul's talking about how to live in the Spirit and how to walk in the Spirit. And walking in the Spirit is being obedient to the law at all times when to the best of our ability. So he says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law said, thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of cuscupiscence. Uh, for without the law, sin is dead. And cuscupiscence right there is just, it's another weird word for covetousness or, or um, lusting. It's a, it's a sexual desire. And what he's talking about there is he, he didn't know what these desires were and what lust was without the law. And he says, he ends it with saying, for without the law, sin is dead. So what he's saying here, so as you can see, Paul says that without the law, sin is dead. This means Yeshua could not have done away with the law, like many say, or there would be no way to know what sin is. We must have the law to know what technically is classified as sin. If there is no sin, then there would be no need for a Messiah. The law still serves a purpose and always will. It remains a place, it remains in place, to convict us of our sin and for instruction in how to live a righteous life. Yes, we will make mistakes, but, but we must try each and every day to live in accordance to His law. Yeshua came so that His blood would cleanse us from our past sins because of the grace provided by His sacrifice. We must turn from our evil ways and live righteously in this present world. 
Think about it. Did Yeshua ever say, I've forgiven you of your sins? Uh, but go ahead and sin as much as you want. You know what I mean? No, he never said that. So as you can see here, um, even Paul says this, without sin, we don't, without the law, we don't know what sin is. We can't even classify what sin actually is. So most churches out there will tell you that you are not to sin. But if you ask the pastor to divine what sin is, uh, they're clueless. They, I mean, they, they may say, oh, it's wickedness or um, it's, it's certain different things like that, but they're never going to tie the sin, sin to the law itself. Because, and so why, why is this? Shouldn't preachers be able to define sin biblically? They should be able to, but they can't simply because the false doctrine that the law was done away with leads to this predicament. Because of them saying that the law was done away with, then there is nothing to define sin. This makes it to where they can't use the Bible to define, to define their doctrine because it goes against their theology. Their theology is the traditions passed down by the elders that contradicts the scripture. Without the law, it would be impossible for us to sin. And since Yeshua died 2,000 years ago to do away with the law, then sin could not exist from then on. Meaning, none of us would be sinners in the world today because without the law, there would be no sin. And therefore, we would not need a Messiah to save us from our sins. This is huge. Let that th sink in for a bit, and, and then I'll reiterate. Um, if the law was done away with, then sin no longer exists. Therefore, we can't be sinners in need of a Savior. I hope you can see how flawed this doctrine is. So this is why, if you, like I've, I've debated this with preachers all over the place, um, good-hearted preachers that, that want to, they, they try to teach biblically, but they've been deceived by the, the church, by the schooling that they've gone to. But ultimately, they still cling to their traditions because when the scripture puts their tr traditions in a bind, essentially they rebuke the scripture and use spiritual jujitsu to find a way to ignore these clear scriptures. I mean, as we can see, clearly the Messiah was teaching to be obedient to the Father, to keep the commandments and all. But we like to take, you know, the false doctrine likes to say that that was done away with because Satan is the lawless one. He wants to lead us into disobedience through lawlessness. And that's just not what the Bible teaches. So clearly, as you can see here, we have to have the law. It still has to be in place or we can't see what sin is. Therefore, we can't describe what sin is. Um, but a lot of these preachers I've talked to them, I said, you know that it says the law, transgression of the law is sin. Uh, they start backing up with that, that uh, spiritual jujitsu there to get away from that and divert the topic because it goes against their theology. That's why we have to be pure to the scriptures and not the doctrines of men. So let's look at some quotes from the Messiah himself. Our doctrine should always be pure from the scripture, not the commandments or traditions of men. Matthew 15, 9 says, But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. How do we enter into life? Um, and I'm asking this question, how do we enter into life? Matthew 19, 17 tells us, And he said unto them, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. That's the Messiah himself saying that. How do we love Yeshua? John 14, 15 says, If ye love me, keep my commandments. Matthew twenty two thirty six 36 says, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Notice that he said the great commandment in the law. This is because we can't love Yahweh if we can't love Yahweh with all our hearts, our mind, and our soul. Then we can't love our neighbors as ourselves because we will not be obedient to him. You know, the law, everybody knows that the law is all about love, right? It, it really, truly is. And we're going to break that down here in a minute. Um, but if we can't love Yahweh enough to be obedient to Him, then we can't love our neighbors as ourselves. So that's why this first one that Yeshua said is the first and great commandment. So, and notice what He says here, Matthew 22, 37 and 38. Yeshua said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. 
This is the first and great commandment. So loving God with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind is the first and great commandment because without that one, we can't keep to that second commandment that summarizes the rest of the commandments like he said. By the way, if you notice here, Yeshua is teaching from the Torah in this statement. See below. Deuteronomy, as you can see up here, Deuteronomy um, chapter 6, verse 5, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. Yeshua lived the law perfectly, so of course he knew the law, which is the, the, you know, the Old Testament of the Bible and the prophets. So this one, love the God, Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, and all thy mind, this summarizes the first four of the Ten Commandments. And I'll break this down briefly for you. Exodus 20, verse 3, on through 20, 11, verse 11, say, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. If you have no gods before him, then that's how you love Yahweh. Thou shalt not make any graven images or any likeness or anything above the heaven or above the earth, in the earth or in the water beneath the earth. So if we're not make, we're not going to make graven images to other gods or to other deities if we love Yahweh with all our heart. And we should not bow down to them nor serve them. For I'm the Lord that Lord thy God and am jealous, a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children for a third and fourth generation of them that hate me, it says. Keep that in mind, because we're going to talk about iniquity later on. Iniquity is transgression of the law. So right here, he's saying those who are visiting or having this iniquity here hate him. And it, he goes on to clarify in the very next statement and showing mercy to the thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Uh, of course, we see this all throughout Scripture. Yeshua said it too. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. Just constantly harping on this. He says here, the Father Yahweh says, if, you're, if you are transgressing the law with iniquity, you hate him. Um, so that's the second commandment there. Um, Thou shalt not take the Lord thy God's name in vain. If you love him, you're not going to take his name in vain. Uh, the last and the fourth commandment here that, that summarizes how we love the Father is thou shalt not take the Lord thy God, or sorry, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not do any work, thy son, thy daughter, thy manservant, thy maidservant, the cattle and stranger within thy gates. He says, for in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that in the is, and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So this is how we know what God we're worshiping here is if we keep the Sabbath day and keep it holy, because he gave one day and set it apart in this specific day. He was specific about this day for a certain reason. Um, and, and, you know, there's a heart thing that's involved with this, whether it's the which sat, when do you believe the Sabbath is, but it's clearly not on Sunday. Um, but he says he is the Lord that created the creator of all things that created the heaven and the earth, the sea and all that in them is. That's how when we keep the Sabbath, we know we're worshiping the one true God. So now we're going to go into to, we're going back up here. As you can see, this is what Yeshua said right here. I'm going right to the very next verses here. Verses 22, 39 and 40. He says, and the second he talked about the first and great command and the second is like unto it. Why is that? Why does he say it's seconds like unto it? It's because it's still, it's summarizing the other part of the commandments. It's from the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. That's key there. Hangs all the law and the prophets. So that summarizes every other commandment, law, precept, um, and judgment throughout the Old Testament and in the prophets. So here Yeshua was again quoting from the law, this time from the book of Leviticus. So look at Leviticus 19.18. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of my people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. So that's exactly where Yeshua got it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Literally verbatim. Uh, and people say that he was disobedient to his father's law, but this is all he taught constantly that's all he taught was from the law from the from the old testament if the messiah studied the old testament and he quoted it verbatim in every aspect of the things that he taught 
and the teachings that he did, then it should be important to us as well. So how do we love our neighbor as ourself? Exodus 20, 12 through 2017 summarizes this for us. Honor that father and that mother. If you love your father and that mother, if you love your neighbor, your father and your mother are your neighbors. So you're gonna you're gonna honor them. Thou shalt not kill. If you love your neighbor, you're not gonna kill him. Uh, thou shalt not commit adultery. If you love your neighbor, you're not gonna commit adultery. Um, thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not steal. If you love your neighbor, you're not gonna steal his stuff. Um, thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's house uh, or his things or his wife. All these things obviously are how we love our neighbor, but if we don't keep the first and great commandment, we can't keep these. Because if we don't love Yahweh enough to be obedient to him, we're never even going to get to this point to where we're loving our neighbor as ourself. So for those who like to say that Yeshua broke his own father's laws, let's look at what John 15, 10 says. He says, if ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Another thing to think about here, Yeshua was the teacher of all teachers and our example of how to live. Why did Yeshua always rebuke the Pharisees for breaking His Father's law if the law did not matter and if He was going to do away with it after His death? If He was going to do away with it after His death, then why did He constantly preach from the law and how to keep it and never say, not once, that it would be done away with after his death. It's because it is eternal. It would be forever important. He was teaching us how to properly follow his father's law and be obedient. The whole Bible is about being obedient. And the churches during the time of the Messiah, the, the synagogue is the Pharisees, led by the Pharisees, were just like the churches of today. Um, they were teaching that we don't have to obey Yahweh, and instead we should follow the traditions of men and religion. This is why they killed him, because he went against their false doctrine. This is why he said we would be persecuted just as he was persecuted, because today we are dealing with the same ingrained satanic false doctrine. If you have not seen my Bible study, Knowing Your Enemy series, uh, please check it out and you will see how the Bible predicted that it would be this way and how Satan would completely infiltrate the church. Satan was fully in charge of the religious establishments back then and still is today. This is why Yeshua was sent by the Father. He then created a church of true believers with the apostles. He died for our sins and then warned us that the church would be infiltrated just like it was back then. A few more scriptures for the New Testament just to seal the deal on this portion of the study. 1 John 5, 2 says, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments, right? Notice these are the commandments of Yahweh, which are the same as Yeshua's commandments. It's the false doctrine that tells us otherwise. 1 John 5, 3 says, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. Revelation 12, 17 said, And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. Why would the dragon be angry at us for keeping the commandments if it did not matter and we could get to enter the kingdom, we could get into the kingdom either way? For those of you who don't understand Bible prophecy or don't know Bible prophecy, the woman is the true church, the bride of Christ. And notice that they keep the commandments of Yahweh. And not also, another thing to think about, to note, is that the law and the commandments are the testimony of Yeshua. He lived the law. You know how like we, we talk about, what's your testimony? And it's like, oh yeah, I grew up over here. I was, you know, I went into sin. I did all these bad things. It's basically your life story, how you came to the knowledge of the truth, how you came to your knowledge of being um, in Christ, right? That's our testimony. <laughs> the whole Bible is his testimony, the law specifically, because the law prophesied his life. It is his testimony. So having his testimony is keeping the law and the commandments. Revelation 14, 12 says, here's the patience of the saints that they keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Yeshua. 
20, Revelation 22, 14 says, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life and enter into the gates of the city. So as you can see here, clearly, if we want eternal life and to enter the gates of the city, we must keep the commandments. So the commandment keepers in Revelation are those who have the right to the tree of life and enter into the gates of New Jerusalem, a.k.a. heaven. As you can see, keeping the commandments is very important. So look at the next few, let's look at the next few verses and dig into some of the key words here. Yeshua is talking about believers here, or so-called believers here. Um, notice that they are casting out devils and calling him, him Lord, among other things. A key requirement to enter into the kingdom of heaven is to do the will of the Father in heaven. Excuse me. So what is the will of the Father? Of course, it's being obedient to his laws and commandments. So right here, this one is a great one. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. For many will say to me, Lord, in that, so for many will say to me in that day, he says. What day is that? That's the day of judgment. He's literally talking about the day of judgment here. If you're not doing the will of his Father in heaven, many will say unto him in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. This is clearly judgment day. If the law was done away with, then why are lawbreakers being denied entrance into heaven? To prove this, let's analyze the last scripture a little deeper. Um, take a look at the meaning of the word iniquity. As you can see up here, iniquity is a Greek word, anomia. It means illegality, that is violation of the law or wickedness, transgression of the law, unrighteousness. As you can see, he says, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. If you are transgressing the law, you are wicked, unrighteous, or a violator of the law, a worker of iniquity. The law, if the law was done away with, or if we were made perfectly righteous in some way magically before Yeshua's return, then who could ever be the workers of iniquity he's talking about? It would be impossible for anyone to fall into this category, but clearly many people will be in this category because few will find the way. So and let's go on to Matthew 7, verse 13 and 14. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. So Yeshua was labeled as a heretic, just like law-abiding Torah keepers are today, are labeled heretics. Because as you can see, the scripture must be our guide and our only doctrine. Now that we know that Yeshua was killed for teaching the same precepts of sound doctrine um, that we are attempting to articulate today, let's go into the scripture and see how the Bible describes Yahweh's law and commandments. Psalms 119, what an amazing chapter of the Bible. But Psalms 119.1 says, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Psalms 119.142, Thy righteousness is everlasting righteousness. Thy law is truth. Proverbs 6.23, For the commandment is a lamp and the law is light and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. So then let's see what the Messiah said in John 14, 6. Said, Jesus said unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. This is critical here. Let's back it up a little bit. So he, Yeshua, is the way, the truth, the life. If we're keeping the law, we're in the way, walking in the law of the Lord. The law is truth. The law is light and the way of life. So, I mean, the law is literally, it's his testimony. We're supposed to be like him to the best of our ability. We're supposed to fall, walk in the way of the Messiah. He walked in the law of the Lord. And if we think we can just purposefully transgress it and continue on and be good to go, that's just not the case. As you can see, the law and the commandments are the way, the truth, and the life. And Yeshua is the way, the truth, and the life. This is no coincidence. 
It was worded this way for a reason, because he came to live the law and teach it perfectly and to be our perfect representative of how to live our lives righteously and holy, yet he was killed for doing it. All right, let's look at some more scriptures here. Psalms 119.3 says, They also, this is talking about Yahweh's people here, they also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways, which is his way, the way, the law. 119.10, My whole heart have I sought thee, Oh, let me not wander from, wander from thy commandments. 119.2 says, Blessed are they that keep his testimonies. It's just all the same thing. It's just different ways of, to word it. And seek him with my whole heart. His testimony is the law. It's his life. It's, his, the, it's the commandments. So, you know, we need Yahweh to open our eyes here. You know, if we're not seeing this, we need him to open our eyes. He says, Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold the wondrous things out of thy law. This is for those people that are out there that are just like, oh, the law is wicked. It's evil. There's wondrous things in it. Um, it when we have obedience to him, we have freedom. We have liberty. So let's just cover a few more verses from the chapter of Psalms 119, the longest chapter in the Bible. Every single verse in this chapter tells us how to live according to Yahweh's law. Literally every verse is about the greatness of God's law and how wonderful it is and how we should delight in it. Um, Psalms 119, 19, I am a stranger in the earth, hide not thy commandments from me. Thou hast rebuked the proud that are cursed, which do err from thy commandments. Make me to understand the way of thy precepts, so I shall talk of thy wondrous works. You know, we were taught faith without works is dead. These are the works he's talking about. These are the works that are required um, to, to have faith. Because we have faith in, in the Messiah, we have faith in him. Like he is the word of God. Like I'll, I'll talk about that later on. He is the word of God. Having faith in him is having faith in the word of God too. Um, it, there's, there's more to it than just a surface level of reading. And faith without works is dead. These are the wondrous works he's talking about here. These are the works that we have to do. Not the crap that the Pharisees were doing, the traditions of men, thousands and thousands of added on laws and commandments and things that they put on top of it. That's not, has nothing to do. That's uh, the salvation by works kind of stuff that the Bible talks about. That's not the works, but there are works that are required and these are them. So 119, 29 says, remove from me the way of lying, grant me thy law graciously. 119.30 goes on to say, I have chosen the way of truth. Thy judgments have I laid before me. So shall I keep the law continually forever and ever, and I will walk at liberty, for I seek thy precepts, and I will delight myself in thy commandments, which I have loved. The proud have me greatly in derision, Yet have I not declined from thy law. And this is where we find ourselves today as believers. The proud, these are the people who are teaching, trying to teach, you know, the, the gospel. But they're too proud to realize that they have to cast off the, the doctrines of men and be obedient to the scriptures. These are the ones who, when they find that the scripture goes against their theology, they do that, that spiritual jujitsu I was talking about, figuring out how to try to get out of it, you know, break out of that lock because they find themselves confined and condemned because the, the, the law is supposed to show us and reveal our sins. And if we're not being obedient to it, that's an issue that we have to rectify. So the proud are the ones that have us greatly in derision. We're always struggling and striving against them, trying to figure out just we want to teach them and we want to show them the scriptures led by the spirit but they but you know we can't decline from the law while doing it this is another scripture that um, many of us believers deal with today psalms 119 53 says horror hath taken hold upon me because of the wicked that forsake thy law and you know this is how we feel when we walk around seeing people who are following false doctrine into lawlessness it breaks our hearts when we see their spiritual blindness as many of you do, we have friends who walk about and talk about the Lord, the Lord, the Lord said this, and the Lord that, and the Lord this, and the Lord that. But when you try to speak scripture to them, they get angry or they shut down and find ways to avoid the conversation. Um, in some cases, they become aggressive. And at this point, all we can do is, 
you know, just back off, pray for them because they have some sort of unclean spirit that can't stand to hear the word of truth. We must remember it's not them, it's the demonic spirit. Um, we're supposed to love our neighbors. And that, and sometimes even like, like Yeshua said, even, even our enemies we're supposed to love. And it's hard to do because um, with these people, some of these people that are lost in the world, they have the enemy with inside them, that spirit of the enemy inside them. And that spirit of the enemy is going to attack us when we come at them with Scripture. But we have to remember it's not them. That's that wicked spirit within them. So just like Yeshua said here in Luke 23, 34, then I said, then said Yeshua, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. He was saying that because those people that were coming after him were the same kind of, they were in, in infested with the same spirit that's coming after us believers these days. Um, but it's not them. It's not that human being. You know, they, they know not what they do because they are spiritually being controlled like a puppet by an evil spirit that is nothing but against God. Psalms 119, 155 says, I remember thy name, O Lord. In the night I have kept thy law. You know, I could go on and on and on for hours and hours tying the law to the name of the Messiah and how we only know him and have a relationship with him if we obey his law and commandments. I could prove to you with scripture that Yeshua is the law of Yahweh. And I'll talk about that a little bit later on, but um, how he is the law of, uh, of Yahweh and how the light at the beginning of creation on day one was the law slash Yeshua being created to govern creation and how it is connected to salvation and how all the parables are tied to keeping the law and the commandments. But for now, I just pray this seed falls on fertile soil and that the Spirit will water it for you and make it flourish. I do want to point out a few more things before we end this Bible study. I hope that you can see that the modern-day church filled with modern-day Pharisees has deceived many with the doctrines of devils that are pervasive in every aspect of religious doctrine. Many people like to say that Paul said the law was done away with, but that's due to lack of understanding for Paul's teachings. See the scriptures below and remember what the word lawlessness means. We talked about it earlier, and I put this one from the New International Version because I thought it, was, it, it just was articulated a little bit clearer. This is Peter saying, So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. Just as our dear brother Paul wrote to you in the wisdom that Yahweh gave him, he writes the same in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant, unstable people distort as they do other scriptures to their own destruction. Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position. Clearly, Paul uh, is teaching, or sorry, Peter is teaching right here that people are going to take Paul's writings and, and follow them and use them to be carried away from these false teachers into the error of the lawless. It means transgression of the law, you know, transgressing the law, lawlessness. Peter said people would take Paul's teachings and distort them to their own destruction into the error of lawlessness. He said this because it was happening already, even in those days. This is why they had to bring Paul in and have him prove that he was not teaching against the law. Therefore, take into consideration the next set of verses. Paul came to Jerusalem to meet with the elders because rumor had gone out that he was teaching against the law. James and the other elders required him to take the vow of the Nazarite to prove that this was not true and that he kept the law. So as you can see right here, it says Paul visits James. So Paul, to give you the context on this, Paul had been out teaching to the Gentiles. James, Peter, and all of them had been teaching to the Jews. Um, and they came together in Jerusalem to meet up and talk about the wonderful works and what they had accomplished in the ministry. So and this is Acts 21, 17 through 24. And when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And the day following, Paul went into with us unto James, and the elders were present. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly uh, the things which God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord. So they were happy about what he had done in the ministry. 
And they said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews are there are which believe, and they are zealous of the law. So they're talking about, he's saying, hey, look at all these great things that I taught, you know, that the Gentiles came to the truth through his ministry. And then they're telling him, check this out. We've been talking to all these Jews, and they've become, they now believe, and they're zealous of the law. This shows right here that the Pharisees weren't keeping the law, not until they became believers, not until they became believers in the Messiah, when they got the ministry from the apostles. They were the Jews which believe they became zealous of the law. That's just like a, a sub stack in this thing here. Uh, that's not the preface of why I put these scriptures up here, but I just wanted to point that out. Um, so they were zealous of the law, and he says, so we go on to say here in verse 21, he says, And they informed of thee that thou teachest the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. They're talking to Paul here. Um, and they informed of thee that thou teachest the Jews which are of the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. What is it therefore? The multitude must come together. So they're saying we need to bring this ministry together. We've got to be on the same sheet of music here, for they will hear that thou art come. So then they say unto him, they, they say to him this, do therefore this that we say to thee. We have four men which have a vow on them, I'm talking about the Nazarite vow. Take them, purify thyself with them, and be at charges with them, um, that they may shave their heads. And all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keep the law. So right here, Paul is going out with a few of the other Jews who are like, hey, we ain't got to keep the law. See, Paul's saying that stuff. So they made them purify themselves, which is taking the now of the Vazirite. You shave your hair, hair off. Um, and there's several other things you do. It's in, in Numbers, I believe, chapter 6. And then after that, you let the locks of your hair grow long, long, long until the end of the vow. Um, you don't cut the hair at all um, until the end of the vow, but you start off with a shaved head. So they took that vow to prove that they're going to walk orderly and keep the law. So every single scripture that the people use to say Paul teaches against the law are taken out of context. As you can see, he proved to them that he still kept the law. Um, but they're taken out of context due to lack of understanding. If Paul taught against the law, then he would be a false prophet, and therefore not a sound Bible teacher, biblically. Also, if we can clearly see that Yeshua taught the law and to keep it, then if Paul was teaching that it was done away with, shouldn't we obey Yeshua and Yahweh over a man? Of course we should. Of course we should. But most people... I've been deceived by these doctrines of devils because their lack of understanding of the scriptures. That's why it's key that we know the scriptures. Um, these people are deceived by this. That they truly don't have a relationship with the Messiah. They believe that they do, but biblically they don't even know him and they don't have his spirit. So the key to not being deceived by these false doctrines and the commandments of men is to know what the scripture says intimately to have a relationship with the Messiah. These false doctrines prey on the fact that most people don't read their Bibles like they should. They might read a daily devotional each morning for five to ten minutes, but then these devotionals are created to reinforce the false doctrine with cherry-picked scriptures while never getting you immersed in the scriptures. Most churches these days teach that we should have a relationship with Yeshua, but again, they teach a very shallow and non-scriptural method to achieve this relationship. Let's briefly look at a few more scriptures just to prove this biblically. Ultimately, our spiritual relationship should look like this. One, we want to be seen worthy in the Father's eyes. Two, the only way to the Father is through the Son, the Messiah, Yeshua. Three, to go through the Son, we have to have faith in Him. Four, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So, like I said there, hearing the Word of God, diligently seeking the Scriptures is what gives us that faith, that gives us that, that conduit to go through the Son to get to the Father and be justified in His eyes. John 14, 16 says, Jesus said unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. So, as you can see, we have to go to the Father 
go through him. Um, by, we have to go through the Messiah to get to the Father. Well, Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Why is that? Because as we hear the word of God, it gives us faith in the Messiah because he is, it gives us faith in the scriptures, um, which prophesy of him, which is his testimony. Um, and as you can see, he is the word of God. So we have, the word of God is critical to this. The scriptures are critical to this. John 1.1 1, 1, uh, says, in the beginning was the word, the word was God, the word was with God. So, sorry, the word was with God and the word was God. All right. John 1, 2 says the same was in the beginning with God. John 1, 14 goes on to say, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and His glory beheld in the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So once we become, once we put our faith in the Word of God, which is Yeshua, which is the Messiah, then we're going to believe it and we're going to study it diligently so that we can know His character more and more and more. And then we come to the, the knowledge of the grace and the truth. What this is saying is that we must hear the word of God diligently, seeking the scriptures that builds our faith in the word, Yeshua. Yeshua is the word of God, that we must build a relationship with him. And despite what the church tells us, there's only one way to accomplish this. And that's through diligent Bible study to show yourself approved. By this, we receive the free gift of grace after we prove ourselves worthy. And I'll throw a couple more scriptures before we're in this thing here. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God. So we can't, if we don't ever read the scriptures, then we're not really studying. Um, and a workman that needed to be ashamed, not to be ashamed, dividing rightly the word of truth. Um, Psalms 119.142 says, Thy righteousness is everlasting righteousness. Thy law is truth. The word of truth. Studying the word of truth, righteousness, everlasting righteousness. The law is truth. This is the truth he's speaking of here. Messiah is the truth. He is the law. He is the word. He is the testimony. The, his, the commandments are his testimony. Luke 21, 36 says, Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape these things that shall come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. So if we want to be accounted worthy, um, we have to study. We have to diligently seek the scriptures. If not, we'll be deceived by these doctrines of men. They're devious and, and they've deceived a lot of people. But I'll end this message by simply saying, will you choose the word, a.k.a. the law, a.k.a. Yeshua, the Messiah, and therefore obedience or the traditions of men? And that's all I have. Um, thank everybody for coming out. I, I appreciate uh, the fellowship. Um, and if you have any questions, I will answer them after this. Thank you.